using the body's own natural defenses to improve cancer treatment. A piezoelectric cockroach. And a journey to understand California's precious water resources. But first, stem cell science meets robotics. All on this edition of On Beyond. So in simplistic terms, it's a brain-controlled robot. I love to learn new things. I'm very inquisitive. I'm constantly asking questions and trying to figure out how things work. I also really enjoyed helping people. About a year ago, I was reading about Dr. Motri in some scientific news, and I was very interested in the work he was doing. I found that his mini brains were really, really interesting, and I reached out to him and asked if I could get involved, and I also said that I had some robotics background if that helped. So a brain organoid is basically a little mini brain. It's derived from stem cells. I did a lot of research into a bunch of different robots, and I determined, along with Dr. Motri and Richard, that a quadrupod would be best to emulate sort of the neural signals, because it's more natural, and it's also a little bit more uh, simplistic. The Motri lab collects all the data just with some electrodes underneath the organoid itself that just measures the electrical impulses. The data is inputted into the program itself, and it starts to parse that data, it graphs it, and it determines how active the brain is. And when the brain is more active, when there's more firing, the robot will go faster. The primary question being asked in this project is how does external stimulus affect development? Without the robotic platform, there's no external stimulus. The organoid itself is not able to interact with the external environment. So we're giving a body to the organoid as opposed to just having the organoid contained in the Petri dish. Um, we're allowing it to interact with the outside world. We're still working on the phase to connect the robot back to the organoid and have the robot affect the and stimulate the organoid itself. Once we close that loop and we implement a real-time system in which we're not using that pre-recorded data and the organoid can actually sit on top of the robot itself and directly affect the movements of the robot. We're hoping to perhaps have the organoids actually interact with one another through the robot. A lot of neurodevelopmental disorders, problems with brain development, such as autism, rely on some of these early pathways. And so through the robotic system, we're able to study these early developments and perhaps cure some of these mechanisms that are present in certain diseased brains. I feel very privileged. Um, I'm very grateful for the researchers and they're very knowledgeable and they've helped mentor me. And I'm very, very interested in robotics and biology and I hope to uh, make an impact and help other people. I could be a doctor or I could work in neurology, something along those lines. One of the human body's most effective immune defenses are the constantly vigilant natural killer cells. Now, using stem cells, researchers at the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine are specializing these natural killers to specifically target cancer. The goal of our work at UC San Diego stem cell program is to improve the human condition through new therapies, interventions, and hopefully, outright cures. Here at the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, Dr. Dan Kaufman is taking a giant step in that direction by using stem cells to help pioneer a strategy being used in a first-of-its-kind clinical trial anywhere in the world taking place at the UC San Diego Moore's 
Cancer Center. We were able to catch up with him to learn about this approach and what it could mean for the future of cancer treatments and perhaps cures. For more than 20 years, Dan Kaufman has worked as a physician to treat patients using cell-based cancer therapies, such as bone marrow transplantation. While still treating patients, he also leads a research group studying ways to improve cell-based cancer therapies for patients with otherwise incurable cancers by using stem cells to make these cell-based immunotherapies into safer, more standardized, off-the-shelf drugs. Clinicians have been doing bone marrow transplant as a form of essentially cell-based therapy for now over 50 years, primarily to treat blood cell cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma. So now really in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of interest in new cell-based therapies and the, the so-called so CAR T-cells or chimeric antigen uh, receptor expressing T-cells. CARs or chimeric antigen receptors have a receptor part that's made to specifically recognize a protein that's on tumor cells that's linked to a, essentially a signaling domain that when that cell sees that cancer cell, the cell becomes activated and it kills the cancer cell. It's a way to treat patients who would otherwise not have any other option and again has had some really spectacular results and those are now um, so-called FDA approved essentially clinical products that we can now order and give patients. Even though treatments for these blood cell cancers have improved and success for bone marrow transplant has improved over the last decades, there's still challenges. Even with the so-called CAR T-cell therapy, there's a lot of optimism around it. That's a cell therapy where it's a patient-derived therapy. You collect the patient's T-cells, they get engineered, which takes a few weeks, and then they're given back to the patient. Not every patient who could benefit from that therapy um, can successfully get CAR T-cell therapy. They might get too sick to wait the, the three weeks or so for that treatment. And there's been a lot of toxicity from the treatment, so even though this can cure, say, certain types of leukemia, a significant percent of patients may get sick or even die from toxicities of the therapy. The other, you know, issue is the cost, because every patient is a made on a patient-specific basis. The cost is somewhere between $300,000 and $500,000 for each patient manufacturing. And so a little bit in parallel, I've been working now for, you know, essentially 20 years using different stem cell populations. And over the past decade or so now, we've moved this into so-called iPS cells or induced pluripotent stem cells to not only look at early blood cell development, but what's been very successful is to make immune cells, and over the last few years we've gotten very interested in a population called natural killer cells or NK cells, which are part of your normal immune system. They're known to kill tumor cells, they kill virally infected cells, and now we're able to make very similar cells from pluripotent stem cells and to start to use those for clinical therapies. One of the interesting things and in, in why we've gotten so interested in the natural killer cells is these don't have to be patient-specific therapies. So NK cells work differently than T cells. So T cells, by and large, only work on your own cells. So my NK cells could kill your tumor cells or vice versa. So what that means is if we make these in the lab, we can essentially treat potentially any patient who could potentially benefit from a relatively small number of starting cell populations we're working now to make hundreds or thousands of doses that can be used to treat wide numbers of patients. So you don't have to wait those weeks for, for therapy. And we also know from other trials of NK cells, we don't see the same toxicities. You don't get the graft versus host disease. So we think that this can also be a safer therapy. So we've developed CARs for NK cells. They have a different set of activating receptors, but they recognize changes on different cells. So again, they can essentially recognize kind of these, I sort of think of as broad 
changes or differences between normal and, and tumor cells or virally infected cells. But if we want to make them more specific, we can use the same type of CARs where we use the same receptor mechanisms to target ovarian cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, so on. We can use different receptors that would target that. So we've now developing these so-called iPS-derived CAR NK cells actually to specifically target different types of tumors. So we typically test the, the function of these different NK cells doing what we call tumor xenograft models. In this example, we were using ovarian cancer, which is a typically more resistant tumor. And we compared natural killer cells or NK cells from peripheral blood, which has been essentially the NK cell population that's been used for most NK cell clinical trials, which have been ongoing for at least 10 or 15 years. So we tested those peripheral blood NK cells to our iPS-derived NK cells in this ovarian cancer model and actually found that the iPS-derived NK cells work better in this system. We got deeper remissions and longer remissions, which I think was, was very exciting, very encouraging. I think this does give a lot of advantages potentially compared to the cell therapy being done now. So we developed systems to make the natural killer cells. The system that we have now is really about three different stages. We maintain the undifferentiated cells. They grow for months or years as undifferentiated cells. The way that we use to differentiate them into hematopoietic progenitor cells is just by aggregating these cells in a dish. They make what are called embryoid bodies or maybe better called hematopoietic organoids. So these are little balls of cells that contain hematopoietic progenitor cells. We take those, we put them into a second culture system where those blood cells and the NK cells grow. So those will grow in sort of what we call the NK differentiation conditions for roughly three, four weeks. We get a, a good number of NK cells. And then if we want to make even more, we add additional cell population. This is a essentially feeder cell line or stimulator cell line that's been engineered to produce factors that are very good for NK cell conditions. And the NK cells will continue to expand for, again, kind of weeks or months. You know, it takes a few weeks, but we can get large numbers of cells and really kind of do this in a standardized manner. My view is, is kind of using the system to make cells more like drugs, right? So if you're taking an aspirin or whatever, everybody gets the same thing. It's very standardized and it's uniform, as opposed to, you know, in bone marrow transplant or CAR T cells now, everybody gets something a little bit different, right? So this is kind of a really unique in the cell therapy field that we can give everybody a standardized cell population. One of the advantages, again, if we can make essentially large scale, a standardized cell therapy like these iPS-derived NK cells, presumably that can be delivered in a more cost-effective manner. That would be uh, another potential benefit. Um, the other thing this allows us to do is to use this as essentially a platform to make genetic modifications to make the NK cells better. We can add other proteins to also enhance the function of the cell. So we can not only make regular NK cells, we can can make them more effective through these different modifications. There is interest in using these type of, of NK cells to kill other chronic virally infected cells. NK cells are known to kill virally infected cells. They kill some viruses better than others. Through adding these CARs or other mechanisms, we think we can use this to better target some of the more resistant viral disease as well. After, you know, working on blood cell development from pluripotent stem cells for 20 years and, and working with iPS cells and NK cells for about the, the past 10 years, we've actually developed collaboration for both research studies and started now clinical trials at Moore's Cancer Center and UC San Diego Health. This is the first iPS-derived cells in trials in the U.S., as well as the first iPS-derived blood cells and the first iPS-derived cancer therapy, as far as I know, done anywhere in the world. And we're developing a new clinical service, what we call cell and regenerative medicine service, to do more cell therapies um, really for solid tumors and, and potentially other diseases as well. 
we've been doing cell therapy for 50 years, but this is really getting to be, if not more and more mainstream, at least more and more part of a key role of, of especially cancer therapy and you know, potentially being used for other diseases as well. And so this is something that, again, we really want to continue to develop this program here and, and really be leaders in this field. We've already accomplished a lot to understand how to make these blood cells from human pluripotent stem cells, how to make immunotherapies. This is now just starting in clinical trials. This is still in early stages. So by five years, you know, hopefully we'll work with our partners to develop a quote-unquote off-the-shelf cell-based immunotherapy that can be given to wide numbers of patients to really not only treat but to potentially give long-term remissions or cures for these more difficult um, types of cancer. And I think that's been one of the real goals of all this type of cell-based therapy is how to move this into these more challenging solid tumors like lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, brain tumors, and, and so on. This is an area that's going to continue to evolve. I mean, I don't expect we're going to have all the answers in five years. One of the analogies I often give people is sort of when I started my fellowship is when antibody-based therapies first started coming to, to clinic. This is a drug called rituximab. But it was like, oh, you know, there was a lot of challenges. How are we going to give this in the clinic? How are they going to make enough of this for all these patients who could, could benefit? There was a lot of sort of mystery about this antibody-based therapy. Now, 20 years later, there's literally dozens of antibody-based therapies that are, you know, FDA-approved, and we use these all the time routinely, you know, in the clinic. And I think importantly, you don't have to just come to a special tertiary care center like UC San Diego to take that type of therapy. You can go essentially anywhere in the world, any cancer clinic in the world, is able to give these type of antibody-based therapies. Where I see cell-based therapy now is where we were with the antibody-based therapy 20 years ago. So it's going to take time to figure out how to grow all these cells, what the optimal cells are going to be for certain diseases or tumors. But, you know, I think over that time frame, you know, the, the hope is really to make this into, a, a, again, a, a standard routine therapy that we can use to treat, uh, you know, anybody who would benefit. Before I came on this trip, I thought I knew California water. So it was a great re-education to be like, oh my goodness, it's so much more complicated and there's so many more people in it than I ever really thought. This 
trip has been extremely powerful to me and it really allowing me to sort of connect the dots of a lot of the issues that I'm otherwise just kind of reading about in the abstract. So being able to follow the source of our water down and really appreciate all the work that goes on around it and in the landscape has just been incredible. We've taken a group of 12 students from four UC campuses all across the state. So the model for this course is really based on ideas around immersive learning and the only way that we believe students are really going to wrap their heads around this complex issue is by experiencing these different aspects of water firsthand. In order to tell the story of California water, we needed to make sure to cover as much of the state as possible. So we went as far north as Lake Shasta, Shasta Dam, and also down through the San Joaquin Valley into the east side of the Sierra Nevada. We felt it was important to really establish a common foundation of knowledge before hitting the road so that students really had an intellectual foundation to draw from. So for about 15 weeks, we met remotely on Zoom and had directed readings followed by discussions. There are so many different people who work in the water world and I knew that, but just hearing what they worked on was very new for me. It's really given me more of an appreciation for people who manage it. So Bull's Farm was great because they had reserved areas just for wildlife to try to bring back an ecosystem there. They were being very progressive in terms of their ecology, how they're implementing different irrigation systems and solar panels. At least they're taking those steps to be more like conservative and to be more just aware of how everything's so connected. Some of these problems are not technology problems. Some of them are policy problems and people problems. As engineers and scientists, we we need to understand that we don't always have the silver bullet. The technology of these dams hasn't necessarily improved over um, the last decades, um, yet we've um, even more recently been building uh, larger dams. For example, the Orville Dam built in the 1970s is one of the largest dams and as we all know now, it faced a near catastrophe. So it's really important to start thinking more about the innovations that deviate from a dependence on technology, but bring together interdisciplinary areas of focus and perhaps come up with softer solutions. When we crossed the Customness, to hear that it's one of the only rivers west of the Sierras that doesn't have a major dam on it, and they're just letting the river do its own thing, and it's just like letting nature do, it, do what nature wants. It was great to see fresh faces and fresh minds get the download on California water. So to see the knowledge base develop through the classroom sessions and interactions with speakers and the whole field portion was awesome. So really the most important dimension of this trip was the human one. Um, and the opportunity to hear and, and learn about the perspectives of the individuals that live and work in these places that we visited. One thing that Californians should know is where their water comes from. You know, what happens when you open your tap because there's such a disconnect. You need to make that connection for us to reach our goals as a state, you know, to make sure everybody has healthy access to water, make sure everybody has access to food. I wish every Californian knew the source of their water and cultivated an appreciation for water because it does have value. And I think a lot of people have lost that because every time they turn the tap on, water flows out. No matter who you are, know where your water's coming from, know how it works, know how everything's interconnected and that it affects something else. I don't just want you to know where it comes from and I don't want you to go as far as the dam that serves you. I want you to go all the way up, past the dam, and see what's up there. Uh, partly because I think it will give most Californians an appreciation for the incredible natural beauty that their water is also creating and serving and partly because headwater management is really important. Californians are really lucky. We have an abundant amount of resources and natural resources to pull from. But in order to have those you know, another 50 years out, we have to do something about the management and allow rivers to connect us. I would want Californians to know that their access to clean water was a choice made by someone a long time ago, that either they wanted cities to grow, booming economics, you know, in parts of California where they wanted farms to be super flourishing. And so they've been invested in, but there's so many people in California that haven't been invested in. And we need to catch up if we want to actually have a sustainable water system. You can't have holes or like people left out if we want it to be sustainable. For me, one of the hardest things to realize is that there's always going to be someone that's losing out. And California water always 
is going to involve conflict. Now is the time for cooperation because I've seen firsthand how farmers, water management agencies, environmentalists are all working together to solve water issues. And that also means that there will have to be sacrifices. I mean, it's not going to be a win-win for everyone. We're going to have to compromise, but that doesn't mean there can't be cooperation to get to that compromise. The one thing that's really stood out to me is the need to build more flexibility into the system and understanding that the status quo isn't going to be able to continue, that maybe some of the rights of access that have been previously enjoyed are going to need to be reassessed. One thing I'd like to share with Californians that I've learned on this trip is the power of empathy. I've been very struck by the benefit of seeing the different perspectives of stakeholders and I think it's through that mutual understanding amongst various groups of individuals that will be best equipped to uh, solve some of these very complex environmental solutions. The culminating experience for the Water Academy was whitewater rafting down the South Fork of the American River and I think that trip epitomizes immersive learning. Not only are you getting wet, you're literally floating by California's history. This is where gold was discovered. This is where California became something. You know, as we say, they came for the gold, but they stayed for the water. So ultimately, we had to see that for ourselves and had a lot of fun doing it in the process. And so that was a good example of a regulated river. A lot of the researchers that came out also had specific studies on that river, so it was great just as we floated down that changes in geology were pointed out. It was fun, it was exciting. A lot of the students had never been on a boat before, so it was fun to watch them get splashed by that first rapid, you know, and the guides were great. Sometimes we were spinning through rapids going backwards, but I don't think anybody got tossed. This has definitely changed how I interact with water. It's time for people to realize where their water is coming from and really give it value and really appreciate it because it is an issue. It's not going away. Water is life for everyone.